Welcome to Melted. This is Frankie Melted Chapsticks Hollywood. We have an exciting show for you today. We have a drummer, a human metronome who's played with the likes of Brian Adams, Matthew Goodband, currently Odd Strippers Union, Cobra Ramon, New Yank Yorkies, Pat Stewart. We're so excited to have him today. We're going to talk about music, his illustrious career that is still going. Uh, he has done so many things. He played at Live Aid. He's done a lot of work in the community, uh, especially with food pantries. And uh, it's just really nice to see musicians that are so extremely talented, but, you know, are caring for the community, and that is Pat Stewart for sure. We are sponsored by Carlino Guitars, the hottest brand in the land. You can find Eddie at 135 Mystic Ave in Medford. He can do custom straps for you. He does work for Slaughter, the Talisman, Kiss, you name it. Slash, he's done straps and guitars. He, he did a nice blinged out version for me. Custom work, Eddie Carlino, Carlino Guitars. He's there all week. Hottest brand on the land, 135 Mystic Ave in Medford. So today we look forward to Pat Stewart. He is from Canada and uh, the Vancouver area, one of the best kept secrets in North America. And we are just going to talk about his experiences, which are many in his career. And he's in about three bands as we speak. And just really working it, which we like. His current band, The Odds. Um, and, and that's the questions that I have for him is his career, his music, what's been going on during COVID for all the musicians, which is been a tough time. Uh, it's just, uh, we just got to keep working and, you know, doing the stuff that we need to make sure things are happening with our art. And you learn a lot from different musicians, just uh, the touring aspects and a warm, melted welcome to a human metronome, drummer, played with Brian Adams, Matthew Goodband, currently with Odds. Strippers Union, Cobra Ramon, New Yank Yorkies, April Fool's Romantic was just released. You should check that out, everybody. He is the self-proclaimed funniest guy in the band, and I believe it. It's been a long road to this point, but in a lot of ways, I'm just getting warmed up. Pat Stewart, how are you, brother? Hey, good. How are you doing, Frankie? You know what? I am grateful, and uh, speaking of which... I noticed a couple things. Not only that you have an illustrious career, we do need to update your Wikipedia page. There's a ton of stuff uh -oh. since 2013 that we need to add because you've been a good call. Good call. Doing know, a lot. I, uh, <laughs> I better find that guy that was in high school that did it about eight years ago. <laughs> who's now an independent filmmaker and doesn't have time. <laughs> well, you know what? Anyone so, uh, can. Anyone can do it, and it's just. Uh, even what you have there now is amazing. And what really touched me is the fact that, and I say this all the time to different people, and I'm grateful I haven't had alcohol in 10 years. It's a day at a time. I, when, when I perform with my band, I hope everybody's drunk. That's what punk music is all about. But a billion people won't eat today on the planet. And what really touched me is I saw you, you, your interview on a train, you know, you're giving, uh, especially with the odds, you know, giving money to food banks, et cetera. What sparked that for you? Is that something that it was collective as far as hel helping out the community? Oh, that's a good one, man. Um, well, that is a program that existed. Yeah, and, uh, the, the Canadian CP rail that we call them up there, yep. which is Canadian Pacific Railway, been around for a hundred and something years. Um, it's a program that they 
they started doing, boy, I, I'm not sure what year, I, probably right around 2000, give or take a year. Uh, so, um, and what happened was uh, a really good friend of mine up here, uh, a guy you need to check in with, his name is Sean Vero. He has a Canadian band called uh, Wide Mouth Mason, like those mason jars. Yes. This guy is incredible. There's nobody doing what he's doing. There probably is somewhere on the planet. He plays with three slides. So his handle on Instagram is try slide, T-R-I, I think, underscore slide. But look him up or I'll help you out and hook that up. Um, you should talk to him someday. He, I would uh, love that. That guy is incredible. Incredible. And he loves Prince. He grew, he's a bit younger than me and, and the guys in my band. So he kind of came up with like Michael Jackson and Prince, but Prince majorly. And uh, anyway, anyway, so his band is super cool. Uh, it has also been really uh, affiliated with a, a gentleman named Gordy Johnson, who is a, a great Canadian guitar player, writer, producer, now living in Austin. His, his project for years has been called Big Sugar. And uh, this is how my stories go. I'm giving you all kinds of background, and then we're going to come back to your... Uh, <laughs> I love it. I love but, it. Uh, anyway, um, that's a whole bunch of stuff. And, and, and Gordy Johnson, that guy's insane. He's, he's so good. Um, anyway, so Sean, Sean Burrow's band and my band, The Odds, we go way back to when they made their first record in 96. And we were finishing up our fourth. And uh, we've always been friends forever. And every once in a while, I've, I've done gigs with them. Every once in a while, they'll hire our bass player or or the guitar player and bass player. And they did some duo sort of, we put the two band names together and call it Odds Mouth Manson or something. We don't do any Cheryl, uh, Marilyn Manson, but whatever. Yes. <laughs> uh, so he calls me, I've, you know, I've done some playing with him before. And he called me back in 2007 and asked would I like to join him and his bass player, because they're a trio, and do this thing called the CP Holiday Train? And I'm, I'm like, well, I'll come and play with you anywhere, any day. Um, what's a holiday train? So then he fills me all in. So that program existed, right? And every year they hire different entertainment. And um, uh, so that was the first year I did it. And it, from... 2007 to for 10 years in 10 years i did it eight times uh and then we had a couple of years off we were supposed to go back on it last year with the odds with a gentleman named stephen page who's a solo artist now you and people know about him from his old band the bare naked ladies oh yes <laughs> which is not punk rock and not metal i don't even know what our show is here frank <laughs> it's, it's totally <laughs> allowed <laughs> but anyway anyway uh, but I think we're going, we're supposed, we're booked. We were supposed to go on it last year. COVID hit, so no. And then we've, you know, recently had some messages. And now that the vaccines are going, if people, you know, if, if numbers go down and stuff, maybe there's going to be able to be uh, us for 10 days in the USA. So you could do a little road trip and come and see us in, I don't know where, Scranton, Pennsylvania or something. You know what? It's, uh, I'm famous in my own mind as a song that I wrote, whether it's in front of two people or. A hundred thousand. I'm famous in my own mind. So it's like, where are we playing tonight? Shediac, New Brunswick. I'm like, I'm there. I'm a star. <laughs> oh, good name. Good handle. Uh, I mean, good uh, random grabbing of a name. Yes. <laughs> so uh, does that answer your question a bit? Well, yeah, a bit. But also I wanted to kind of parlay into, you know, I like to talk about that I'm 28 again, just like you. Because you're just getting started. I started music much later in life. But right. the, uh, the other step is with the technology, Spotify, YouTube, etc. I noticed on your page the token of gratitude. Because I've got a little Dogecoin going on uh, trying to uh, finance the next tour. <laughs> um, so tell me a little bit about the token of gratitude. Oh, gosh. Well, that is our manager. It is like he, uh, Parkside Mike is this gentleman's name, and he manages us and a really great Canadian band you need to check in with called The Dirty Nil. Trio, kind of, 
there's some 1992 Seattle thing in there somewhere. It's in his guitar playing or something. They're, those guys are amazing. So he manages them and a bunch of different things. And he, he's, he's got so many, so he's got things going on. So I just, he sent me an email uh, to us and a bunch of people, you know, band members and saying, hey, here's a thing that's coming up. And it sort of explains it. Um, but I'm not super clear on it. I was just with our bass player yesterday hanging out, and uh, we were just talking a little bit about it. Part of it is they're taking artists and putting together with some sort of a AI, artificial intelligence program, and there's going to be music composition going on. That's part of what they're doing. But I'm not totally clear on it because it just, just like a week ago, he sent this thing out, and I, I went, oh, well, I'm going to share that. Yeah, I want to help him with his work. Well, oh. being 28 again myself, I remember when a pager came out, and it's like, yeah, well, what does that do? You know, everything's <laughs> constantly changing. And there's a saying that said, uh, humans were free when we had a cord on a telephone. Now that we're cordless, we're not free. So, you know, technology, it can be great. It, you know, there, there's a dual side to it, but it is happening, and... I know when I hear about the NFTs, I believe people are doing music and, you know, selling these things. It's just, you know, where things are going. And okay, as, now, as, a, as a late starter here, there's so many terms. You just said NFC. Or I NFT. I know what it is, I think, but what is it? So basically, I guess what they're doing is they're taking art and music and digitizing it into a monetary thing, I believe. Um, so it's kind of like with the crypto craze, uh, Bitcoin, and crypto craze, yeah. it's, uh, you know, it's just the next new thing. And, uh, you know, with that again, Bitcoin was made to be outside sort of, you know, government's reach. And then of course we have government that wants to reach into things. So I think a lot of artists and, you know, different sports personalities are making their own money with their picture on it. And then people bid on it. So we've got to... What's great about when I look at what you're doing now is that it's, it's kind of like... And I wanted to ask you your philosophy with when we had the old school band, it's live or die with that band. But it's... You're doing odds, strippers union. I love Cobra Ramon. Um, oh, great! And uh, you know the song. I I got to listen to Black Mountain, and yeah. you know it's great stuff. And then when I look at New Yank Yorkies, that crew. When you put, you know, hey, I'm the self-proclaimed funniest guy. Then I look at your uh, your mug there. I'm like. This guy's rough and tumble. I wouldn't cross him. You know, it's just, it's it's great that you're able to collaborate now. Have you seen that over time? Because I talk to a lot of artists, again, Rudy, different people. Um, my buddy's the talisman. They've played for Gene Simmons. They play for Ace right. Freely. Uh, but also with that, it seemed like I was really shocked and um as far as when you played with the Matthew Good Band, you guys got a lot of awards and then ended it. So are bands like Marriages, in your opinion, or how have things evolved? Uh, do you say like Marriages? Yes, are they like Marriages? And, you know, it, that's it, exactly, man. We always said, we said that in the odds forever. And, you know, um, uh, in, in the case of that band, I was um, a good friend of mine, a young guy that I used to teach. He was the original drummer. They did in the middle of the third record. He kind of went, you know what? Enough. I, I, I've been, you know, since he started playing with these guys when he was about 18 and they were, they were between six and 10 years older than him. So by the time, you know, he was like in his mid twenties, he went, you know, there were some elements. There's like, there's, it's like having brothers and, um, uh, it's like a marriage, man. Yes. And there's shit, there's stuff that has to happen or tries to happen or can happen. And sometimes people just, you know, he just went, I'm done. And so he left. And I it was, um, 
bass player is a great friend of mine forever. And, and then he said, Hey, this just happened. So get down to the studio on Monday and bring all your gear. And I went, Oh my God. Yes. Cause I was at, literally at a crossroads going, okay, what, what's up now? I just finished the tour. I, you know, I really just got home a couple of days before and I was going, I was trying to figure out what, there was a couple of options out there, but they weren't awesome. Uh, anyway. Uh, so it is like a marriage, um, a back a step. So the Matthew Good band is a band that existed. And all those guys, yeah, they did, I, I forget, five records or something. And in 2000, on the day that record was, re- that last one, um, I want to say Audio of Being, I think. Um, it, the day that album was released in 2000, they announced, yeah, we're, we're, we're done. We're splitting up. So that album, you know, a bunch of singles came out and all that stuff, but they didn't tour or anything on that. And then a couple of years later, Matt went solo. So that's what I did with him. He's, he decided, and it still is, he's, you know, he's, he makes a record at least every year. And uh, I, he started going solo in 2002. And so uh, we did a record that summer. We did another, you know, for about four years there, once a year where I did a record with him. Yeah, that's, it's amazing, then, you know, because I just thought that, like, wow, you have so much success, and then end it and walk away. It must be, you know, yeah, and it's... And it's that's a conversation, that's yeah. a great interview with any of those guys. Yeah. Uh, but that was, and that was also, like, I, you know, I mean, I heard stories working with the, one of the guys yeah. in his solo project, you know, it was just, it was just, it got really, really tense, and... You know, you got one or two people that are the kind of the ringleaders and um, they do as much as they can. People in Canada love them and they love those songs. And there's there's lots of great songs, you know. It's a big soundtrack to the 90s. And, you know, I run into some friends that are, you know, everybody's in their 40s now or whatever. They go, oh, man, when I was at college, all those Matthew Good Band songs. And we saw them at this festival and that festival. You know, they, they were in, in 99, 2000, they were like one of the except for the Tragically Hip, who have been one of the biggest bands up here forever. Um, but those guys were probably the next biggest band in Canada, you know? Um, so that, um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, um, well, it's sort of part of your question leading up to that. You, you said a couple of interesting things, like you said, uh, would you say old old school bands that just stay together? Right. Or say if you think of the Motley Crew, or, you know, you know, you can't even say kiss to a point, but like, it's either us or nobody, but what I've been seeing now is, and that's what I was going to ask you as well, with the odds, a lot of you guys are in Strippers Union. Um, and then you're also, you know, doing Cobra Ramon, uh, New Yank Yorkies, and then April Fool's Romantic was just released. So it seems. I don't, what is that? What are you talking about? What's that one? I, I, you sent me a link to that. No, is that not yours? No. This is where the edits come in, <laughs> um, <laughs> or we leave it in just to show my. What the hell? <laughs> April Fool's Romantic. Yeah, I, I got. I don't know why that came up on a link that I thought you gave me, and that's. Did I? Should I look at your little uh, our messaging here on the Instagram? Yeah, it, uh, yeah. Take a peek, Frankie. What are you doing? <laughs> but anyways, we'll edit that out. But I thought, wow. But I guess the point is too, is that you're you being with, you know. Oh, I see. Hang on, I gave you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. See, uh, well, I don't know. Uh, yeah, he he calls it that now. So I forgot all about that. Okay, thank you. I feel and a little that, better at my age of 28 that's, that's for the third century. A, uh, <laughs> that's more of a, a studio project. Like uh, the guy that I told you that produced it, longtime friend, great producer, bass player. He worked with Bob Rock in his program for a number Jerry, of years. You're talking uh, about Jamie Cox? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, he's a guy I've known for years. And, and thankfully, like one time <laughs> I was in the middle of hell. We owned a home out of town, and I had to go over there and clean up the mess that some horrible tenants made and caused, like, thousands of dollars of damage. So I'm over there for, like, a week, me and my dog and borrowed a pickup truck and just cleaning up shit. 
and he and Jamie calls and he goes, "Hey, I got this project coming up, and um, they don't have a drummer, but you, would, it would be great, man. Are you interested?" Blah blah blah. And I said, "Yeah." So that was one thing we did, and that guy made that guy used to have a, a real thing in the '90s, you know. And it seems like lately I do these projects, and I'll do something with Jamie, you know. And it's like you're in the studio for a day or or a couple of days, and then maybe a month later, or two months, you do another couple of days, and now you got ten or twelve songs. And it just sounds incredible, and, and everything about it is just awesome. And you're so happy about it. But it's also a, a, an era of anyone can make amazing sounding records. Well, not anyone, but he can. Leave he me, can. Leave, leave my band out of this, pal. <laughs> punk, punk rock saves us, but go on. You're right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, But anyway, it's just that indie era. Like I do, I've been doing records for, like, whatever 25 years like a little project on the side you know my band we're, oh, we're not on tour this day or this week or for four months or whatever and i just always like to keep busy it's just what i've always done because i love playing and so these little projects come up so i did this project with with jamie and then another thing came up and this guy named daryl which is now april fool's romantic which is i don't know it's just that he just he the, He's got them dough, and he wanted to make the recorded songs. And it sounds and, uh, great; it really does. I listened through it, and I was like, amazing "Makes stuff. makes me feel great." Oh, good! I'll pass that on. I, you've said a lot of cool things. I got a lot of messages to send out later. Yeah, people. But um, you know, and he's just a guy. It's very interesting and very sort of almost nerdy keyboard guy. And and it's, I get these little emails where, "Oh, here's the three songs we're going to do this week." And I'd listened to it. It was like a guy sitting with a, a keyboard, an eight, he's got all these 80s vintage keyboards and a little drum machine playing through some speakers. And then he just put his iPhone down and he just played it and had it at a volume that he could just sing. I don't think he had his vocals mic'd. He's just singing. And I'm listening to him going, God, this is weird. But, you know, we, we showed up. I played the part that a drummer that would go with the, those chords. And here's a verse, here's a chorus, here's a solo, here's a bridge, whatever. You know, you write an arrangement. But once you put bass and guitar and everyone played their parts, it really wasn't a re- it was nothing like I was like, it seemed so weird. And it almost it made me realize to go, you know, with the right set of ears directing things, you can make lots of things sound amazing. Like it makes turn it into a great song. But we didn't really edit or change arrangements or anything from these funny little demos that he sent me, you know. Well, so do you, that was. but a question um, with that is, how do you feel doing the individual tracks of just the drums, the vocals, the guitar pieces separate, or, hey, we're going to do 10 takes of the same song together? Or you mean like five people in a room? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's what I've always done. That's what, whenever I've read these articles where big name acts like, uh, gosh, I don't know. There's a, there's a band from Canada called Simple Plan and uh, other bands that are sort of rock bands. Like I remember reading articles in the nineties, you know, in, in musician magazine or whatever. And guys talking about, well, certainly with Bob Rock, who, who's, who's one of the great rock and roll producers and he's a good friend and, um, and other people, they go, yeah, so this, this record really blew, blew our mind, man. We, I, I'm thinking, okay, you guys are Warrant, or you're, I don't even know who it was. <laughs> right. But they're going, they're talking about how their mind was blown that they sat in a room, four people, and they were all mic'd up, and they just did takes together. And I'm like, well, A, that's what you're supposed to do, and B, you're supposed to do that because you're a rock and roll band. Right. Don't call yourself rock and roll and, and, and do this sort of, other kind of, you know, the way you would make a Mariah Carey record with David Foster or something, you know, separate tracks at a time. And that has its place. And that's cool. And I sometimes do, do things where people go, yeah, we're just putting drums on it. Okay, we're adding drums to this demo. But when you're a rock band, <laughs> you're doing all and you're in the papers because of all your awesome shenanigans. <laughs> you should be in a room. You should be working for the producer. Yes. That goes, I want you all sitting in a room. And, and so I love it when, when you hear those stories, you're going, yeah, that's what you do. You sit in a room like Bob, you know, I, I worked on a project with him and someone was in the room and was like, I don't get this. Or, or oh, oh my God, this is these, these, this kind of pop boy band thing we did where 
they wanted to use Bob Rock because they like the Michael Bublé records that he makes. And these guys are these four dudes that sing together and they have been for 20 something years. And, and we were doing a, they were doing a record of covers and it was all like sixties, like Motown and under the boardwalk and this kind of stuff with these four part harmonies. And they said, they were, we went for a beer after they're going, this is blowing our minds. I go, what do you mean? And they go, we have never sat in a room and tracked sang the vocals while the band is putting the track down. And, you know, we're out there playing Keith Scott from Brian Adams band. He was, he was playing guitar. Um, one of the best in the world. And we're, we're doing our thing. And, you know, comics are going, Fuck, man, those guys can really sing well, four parts and their tuning is perfect. And those guys later are going, we've never sat in a room doing what we do with guys, you know, like we've played live with our with our stage with the band that we tour with live, but we've never done this, you know. So it's interesting when that stuff comes up. And I wonder also, again, I think it comes down to technology. And when you have, you know, even your Apple phone, you can do so much, or Garage Band, uh, et cetera, yeah. cutting and pasting things together. Where back in the day, you had the reel to reel. It was super expensive, and you're all in a room. You know, and then uh, I think the thing that that hasn't changed is that, like, you know, it isn't as expensive. I know in in the early '80s, before I worked with Brian, I had this band, and it was like a big deal. Like we were, we our sound man knew the singer from this kind of famous Canadian band, and he was interested to produce a couple songs for us. And then so he took two cassette players and, and did his edits that way. He went, okay, I like this intro and verse, but I'm going to cut it there and, and double that at the second verse. And then we get the chorus or whatever. He did this amazing work with two cassette machines. And then we were like, I don't even know where we got the money for the tape, which is always expensive. And, and we got the machine for uh, two inch machine to lift up in the stairs into our uh, living room of our house and, and record these songs, you know, but it was, but the thing that should remain the same is good songs and people tracking music together. Right. You know, and doing a good job of it. It, it is easier and all the technology and the cutting and pasting. But uh, I think I, I, I'm, I, I'm fortunate that at the time that I and, and plenty of my peers came up, it was a time where, like you said, there was tape. And things were more expensive and all that. So maybe that's why people did a lot of pre-pro because it's so expensive. We don't want to waste tape or we don't, we can't buy this many rolls. We're going to keep, you know, you would do, you could get maybe three takes on a roll and you go, okay, well, we've got room for, okay, we're going to keep that take. And then, you know, then you got to transfer that take over to this master roll. And okay, we got room on this tape for two more. Let's, you know, you start on your next song and, and all that stuff. Right. And, uh, I'm kind of going all over the map now, but, um, you know, just is it, 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 fortunate to have come up at a time when, uh, um, you, you had to do a take really well. Right. You know, I, I, sometimes I'm in a session now and I realize I go, okay, we just did four takes. I go, Hey, you know what? Let's just do the last, let's do that eight bars, the last eight bars. Let's do the outro. Well, let's just redo the intro. Well, I'll do more takes, but, let's just redo the intro because we kind of fucked that first one up. Then, then it's like, add that to the other, the take we just did. And okay, good. So, you know, like I know the technologies there, but I don't, I don't exist to function like, well, you can, you can just quantize me, you know, like I was ahead of the click on that section. Um, you know, if anything, and sometimes I'll do, you know, the take is really good. It's a little bit funky in that section. They can just, they could take it from another take. I mean, we did that with, Brian Adams did that with, uh, even before I was in the band, he's told me stories. That's just the way he, that's why his records and his drum tracks are so freaking good. Because he would do six to eight takes and it was Mickey Curry or it was me or it was Steve Smith. And he would go, okay. And he would sit down and listen to take one. Okay, and you know, and, and he would make this. He's got this whole chart system, and and so at the end of it, he go, okay, well, we're gonna edit some takes together to make the ultimate drum track, you know, and and that that happens, and it still happens, but with technology, you can, I mean, you know, auto tune. Wait a minute, aren't you supposed to show up knowing how to sing? And sing <laughs> my um, my mother told me, um, Frankie, you sound much better in the mask 
Thank God for uh, the mask. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's the thing. My father's a police officer. And when I was younger, he came in into my bedroom and he ripped down a kiss poster. And, you know, it's just like I, I just love it. It's Were you in the kids' army? <laughs> I, I, I think I still am. I, maybe I could. Yeah, I, you know what? I probably still am, too. Yeah. When that record came out in 76. Yeah. And, and anybody that could, anybody that got it was in the army. <laughs> I just heard somebody I know say that the other day. Like, I, I forget who, but uh, it was funny. No, and, um, you know, I love it. And the point being is, is that. When I had another interview, they said 60,000 songs per day are released on Spotify. And I, my reply to that is this, is that we're making our art. It's your art. It's my art. That's why the joke, hey, my band is big in Japan or somewhere else. Um, yeah. You know, so, so that's what we're doing. And it's interesting because we're doing our first album and you know it's just interesting you know to hear and to talk to people about the process and how people have done things and you know it's nice to hear that the bottom line for you seems whatever it is have your parts down and have it be have it ready yeah um a lot of stuff, you know, that New York Yankees thing you talked about was because we all do a lot of sessions um, for a while there. It's, it's, sort of, it's, it's changed a bit lately, but uh, we, there's this one studio in town, and we did a lot of kind of country sessions. And one of the guitar players there is, 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 uh, spe- specifies as he's just played in a lot of country bands for years. And, you know, but nowadays country, a country recording session is, you know, like a lot of it is, it's kind of, it's like post Nickelback style, like the, the drumming is, and all of that is post Pearl Jam, right? So right. it's very rock, rock and, I, I don't, I, I say rock and roll, but I mean, some things like that, like modern country, it's rock, you know? Right. And it's I really, fun. it's fun to go in and play. Um, uh, shoot, I just lost my train of thought because of, of what you were saying. No, no worries. I really loved Bring Back the Love. And when I was listening to Bring Back the Love, at first I was like, wait a second. All right, what is this? And I said, it's, it, it, it gave me a little Grateful Dead feeling for a second. And then as it went through, I was like, wait, this is Southern. This is so Southern rock. It was just, it was fantastic. I guess it is, eh? and people say, because you're in a part, another part of the continent, so that's kind of cool. And around here, the comments people go is they say Little Feet, who were uh, at a California band right. that were inspired by all kinds of music all across America, you know, and, and a lot of New Orleans. And uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting one that one, and I'm I'm glad people are liking it. We just kind of one of the guys had this song idea, and he's like, well, let's just try that, and and. Um, there was some song from the '70s. He's going, yeah. Make it doesn't make sure we don't sound like that song by her. And we're like, oh yeah, right. This, this, that chord movement kind of is similar to that song, and we just sort of did our thing, and and it was very no brainer. I don't, I you know, um, and sometimes that's the best stuff. You're not really thinking about it, and I'll have guys come up to me months later and go, hey, remember that track we did for so and so? Yeah. He goes, you got to hear how it turned out, man. It's really good. And I'm going, oh, and then I'll hear it, and then. And then I think back and I go, oh, yeah, I remember that day. And it was it was a session. We all got a call, you know, we're going to go play these songs for record these songs for this person. And uh, I do a lot. So I, I really can't. If someone goes, hey, remember that? I go, no. But if you play it, it's all going to come back because I did a lot of shit since then, you know. <laughs> but it's nice when you just sort of you're with some people you like. The vibe is good. And, and you, it, the arrangement is known. That's the key thing is comfort, right? comfort to be able to just kind of do things that you might try and you know uh in a way i I tell drummer friends of mine i go i think i'm paying tribute to steve gadd on that track because um he's one of my favorites and there's just something that happened when i was because of that tempo and the nature of what i was hearing and the way that bass player or that guitar player was doing a thing i just went oh i don't know i'm gonna do this you know 
like everyone does. Yeah. I mean, it's great. And Um, I, I also think that when, you know, drummers, I think the jazz influence, I think, and I really appreciate watching some of the documentaries with Neil Peart and right. different time signatures and different exploration. And uh, I think that's where it comes from. And I think over time, as we talked about, um, say, Beatles, Stones, moving into Nirvana, Pearl Jam, etc., the changes... You know, it's all building on it as well as the evolution. But also, you could go back to classical and kind of look at some arrangements and say, wow, you know, that's interesting. It's all really call and response in different ways. And you have so much experience. And this is what I was going to ask you because, you know, with the odds and again with COVID and it's probably the same across all of your bands, but it was nice to see the different songs, even the cover of the Ramones. You guys are all on video, you know, separately tracking, having a blast, which is like yeah. we're making the best of this until we can tour. Um, but as but as far as if if I name to you, you know, the odds, uh, stripper, strippers union, Cobra Ramon, um and New York Yorkies, sort of what overlaps and what doesn't with within those bands? Oh, I mean, what overlaps? What overlaps and what doesn't musically with... Okay, that's cool. That's a great one, man. I think what, uh, for me, okay, well, the overlapping in all of it is me. Yeah. <laughs> but, the but, good-looking, and, self-proclaimed funniest guy. <laughs> I'm sitting with Cobra, um, and and you know her thing, like she loves Lemmy, and a bunch of things like that. When I just met her through at same through Sean Barreau a number of years ago, she needed a drummer, and we just since uh, for eight years now. And uh, if I'm sitting there with her, um, and we're playing one of her, like some, I showed up and there was a body of work to learn. Then we slowly started just kind of jamming, and and she was, you know, she's younger and and has a different uh, level of experience uh, regarding writing and recording in the studios and bands that I do understandably. Um, life is experience, right? Length of time. Yes. And so we get jamming. I just doing something and she, she's screaming, going, Oh my God, we just wrote it. Blah, blah, you know, and it's awesome. It's beautiful. Cause it's natural. And we're screaming and yelling. Cause it's, a, we just wrote a thing and, and it's a gas. And if I'm sitting with uh, the guy, you know, so we're trying out parts, and we go, hey, let's try that again. Let's play that, and then just come in, sing in this way or whatever. You know, we just sort of – I feel the same um, in all of those situations, and it's just that it's the natural, organic thing of playing music. Um, Strippers Union and Odds maybe have a little more in common stylistically. Um, there's something in – there's a little bit of blues and rock in all of those bands, you know, and Cobra Sing is probably a little more that way or whatever, you know? Um, a lot of times when I'm working on things in that band, I, I start thinking about Bill Ward, like old Black Sabbath. Yes. And I love, I love some of that stuff, you know, and when we were, um, for sure, when we did, um, I don't know what's that song, when we did Black Mountain, I was, cha- I was thinking about, we got going on and went, oh, and, and I, you know, Spotify dialed up and I, uh, it's called Hole in the Sky, which is a weird album that Sabbath did called Technical Ecstasy. I think it was the one after Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, like my brother's a couple years older and he had, he was bringing home all of those. So all those first, like any great band, right? The first four records up till Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath. Like I, I just heard it or my brother was always playing it so i just heard it and i began to really like it and then that album in particular and then oh the next one came out so i bought a sabbath album but i remember hole in the sky was you know slow and sludgy and really cool i mean i i never i, I never sat with that groove in in 1976 or 7 and went hey i'm gonna try to play that groove 
it wasn't until fucking 35 or 40 years later when I was jamming with somebody, Cobra, and he went, oh, I, I, I couldn't remember what song, but I knew it was a Bill Ward thing, and I had to do it. You know what I mean? So anyway, that, that, the overlapping is, I think, just the organic nature of playing and loving and writing music in a room with some people. Yeah, and that's and that's super important because, you know, obviously as as we grow, again, I remember the T-shirts in junior high, of Sabbath, bloody Sabbath, and being, you know, in a Catholic household, we weren't allowed to have any of that stuff, and you see it. Oh right. Um, but you you look at that stuff, and it's um, it's just kind of like a Rubik's cube in a way where you're just trying to fiddle, fiddle around to get everything to match. But it also is the chemistry of, for you to be able to do what you're doing now, which is, you know, enjoying your time and just constantly being busy with several sets of groups of people, it's, it's you, you wouldn't have that. You would have probably 10 projects if it was with, 10 great groups of people. If it was, say, the five, and a five that you're just like, no, I'm not going to waste my time. So I think that's that's really cool that you've been able to find that, as well as to continue to influence all these groups. Well, that's cool. To, uh, you know, thank you. That's cool to hear that, because sometimes you just don't think of it. And uh, as you're saying, I go... I guess that is kind of good. Like I just naturally do. I, I just say yeah to everything. I always have, and once in a while, it's rare. Uh, you'll be like, "Uh oh, you're double booked" or something, right? Yeah. Actually, there's a thing coming up this week. I'm still waiting to find out if I'm double booked. <laughs> well, well, I mostly uh, these <laughs> days not as much. You know? Well, but, but um, <laughs> you know, this is the bottom line too. I had an interview with Ryan Roxy of Alice Cooper, and we're in the middle right. of our interview, and the phone rings. And he's like, oh, I didn't realize I double booked. And I was like, well, take the call. I'll talk to you later. He's like, no, man, it's cool. But it's like with, well, this leads me to something else. Um, I thought COVID was going to be a long weekend. That's all I thought it was going to be. A long weekend. Yeah, that was it. I, I really like, one of my girlfriends was like, Frankie, just come over. And I'm like, all right, it's only a long weekend. Um, okay. <laughs> it's, it's been, yeah, right. but I got my vaccination two weeks ago, my J and J uh, and, but, but with that, with that time, you've still been busy, which is great. What has, ha- what has fueled your philosophy? I guess, is it spirituality to keep it going for me? You know, I can't control people, places or things. It's how we react to it. Stoicism, um, I'm in control of how I feel about it. That doesn't mean there's days where there's a lot of loneliness and you're like, and oh, we're talking about, we're talking about COVID time. Yeah. But also with the fact that you're still keeping busy with these bands. Um, yeah. Well, the, so it's, it's almost like a, a double question. Or I, I thought you were going to say, what's your philosophy about all that? About the well, yeah, no, no, no. I mean, it's, about the COVID. Yeah. You know, I've been thinking, this morning when I was making coffee about how I, I was going to be talking to you today. And, and, and one thing that's happening, you know, the great equalizer is that, you know, I watch, uh, what is it? Some, some mornings after the, with the, when in Vancouver, after the news ends on comes Kelly Ripa and uh, Ryan Seacrest, yes. you know, Oh, okay. And that's kind of there. And that, that'll stay on for a while or something. And then we start getting on with the day or something. And, you know, and, I realize watching that, I go, every one of us feels, in a sense, we feel, some people have very serious anxiety and depression about and because of this. Yes. And that's, uh, it really sucks. It's horrible. There's a few people I know that, you know, everyone deals with it differently for sure. But, but, the, but the broad stroke of this is we're all doing the same thing. What's Barack Obama doing? Or what is fucking Sammy Hagar doing? Or, or Alice Cooper? Or anybody that we're talking about, right? What are they doing? We're all doing the same thing. Well, mostly, hopefully, you know, because there's a bunch of safe 
smart choices that we have to make. We've been told, here's what you got to do. You know, I, I just heard a, a news story on on the radio on the way down there. They go, oh, he's a chief, ex chief of police from this community. Blah blah blah. Uh, we spoke on the weekend. He got COVID. He's in ICU on a ventilator, but he said he's getting over the hump. And I think they were going to play a recording of a, a, an interview with a person. And this is what I think people need more of. The, 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 the naysayers, the, the anti-maskers, the non-believer. I don't know how you not believe that. You know, um, the, you know. We I think we need to see and hear interviews with people that are in it, that are going into it, or that are coming out of it. One of my dear friends, Chris, now a few years younger than me, in way better shape, jacked, strong, and he goes, Frankie, this is like a month and a half ago. Frankie, I have an ammonia. I'm going to Florida for the weekend. And I'm like, bro, maybe you should postpone the trip. Then he calls me. He goes, I have COVID. Then he's in the hospital for a week. Um, they said, you may have blood clot. And it was very, it's very serious. Um, so, yeah, I mean. That's what, scary. Man. Yeah, it is. And this is the thing is that, again, it's nature bats last. This is just the bottom line. And that humanity and what we're doing, we get to a point and it's like George Carlin, the famous comedian who I love to listen to from time to time. He said, oh, yeah. he, well, he, I love it. he said, the earth, everybody save the earth, save the whale, save this, save that. He said, yeah. the earth doesn't need you. 99% of the species are extinct. You're next. And it's like, you know, you just think about it. We do have to make those safe, smart choices. And I do just out of respect. And my other thing is, is that if I can make somebody laugh under their mask once uh -huh. a day, it's been great. So I'll go to our local pharmacy, crack a quick joke. You know, I'll see, and I'll be like, stop having better hair than me. I have long hair. And, you know, whatever it is. But if you can get some laughter in the midst of all this. Because, again, before COVID, we all had to deal with our stuff. And then it's, you know, a pandemic. You know, also, yeah. you know, our most famous quarterback in the NFL, uh, Tom Brady, his father, and mother got COVID. So it's not like money is going to protect you from this thing. A mask no. will. And just common sense. So yeah. as we get vaccinated. I saw that you had interviewed his dad. Yes. I didn't know. I just was looking through your, your Instagram page and all the things you've done. And so that's interesting. And how are they? You know what? They're doing very, very well. Um, you know, and that's, that's, that's because, the. You know, they're probably in their 70s, right? The, they are. They are. And just to, uh, you know, look at all this stuff. I, I, again, for me, you know, when you go back to, there's a little good you can grab from everything, but we have to implement it ourselves. And uh, they um, are really for having, you know, such a famous son. And you've been around famous people. And I think that when it comes down to, and this is what I was going to ask you as well, being grounded and helping people out, you've had many Led Zeppelin moments yourself. And I was just going to ask you about, you know, you played at, at Live Aid. You've mm -hmm. done, so w what were those experiences like? And how do you keep it in, in your mem memory museum and still stay grounded? Yeah, that's a good. Uh, that's a good one. Well, first of all, those those uh, experiences were in, incredible. I was twenty two. I mean, incredible. <laughs> oh, and at that time it was June, so I probably just turned twenty three. Nice. You know, um, crazy though. Uh, I did do a Zoom interview with a university uh, professor recently who does a communications course. So we had these students. There was like eighty of them or something on the screen. You know, I couldn't see them all, but lots of them, and him. And, you know, talking about, well, one of the topics that came up was, was we started talking about this, about live hate. He goes, 
here, let's just watch this and for a second. So he puts on, and I forgot this, we opened our set with a song called Kids Want to Rock, which is vicious. It's fat, It's a rocker. It's, it's kind of a 12-bar rock song, and it's, re- it's really great. And at the time, nobody had a song like that, really. Not, certainly not in mainstream and MTV world, you know. And so, you know, people knew Brian because of some of the other songs and the ballads. But he was a rock and roll guy. He loved all kinds, right? I'm watching this clip with these people, and I'm like sort of my – I'm getting tense. I'm like, my fists are gripping, and I'm watching us, the 23-year-old version of me, and I'm cracking up going, man, we were bold to come out and open with that song because you kind of want to be warmed up a bit. You know, right. And my thing, I've done it a few times, especially in those days, because I was very young and just more excited than experienced. I'd be like, let's go. woo!" <laughs> and I come out and I get about a minute into the song. Go, oh, I didn't think of it at the time. But what I know it as is I came out of the gate way too hard. And maybe maybe it's, it's OK at that show. And at that moment, I watch and I go, oh, it's a little bit fast. It's not bad. And a lot of times, you know. If something's 100 beats per minute on the album, that's amazing on the record, and it makes it heavy, and uh, there's a lot of reasons why it's good. And live, you sort of naturally bump it up maybe five beats or something, and you, it's just a little bit quicker. But people don't really leave the show going, oh, I loved it, but, well, he played uh, that song five beats too fast. You know, they don't really do that. If it's extremely over the top, people will notice it and probably talk about it. But anyway, uh, I was I was just cracking up that, Watching us play the opening of, of our set in, uh, at Live Aid, doing that, you know. Um, we also did a thing a year later that was called uh, Amnesty International, A Conspiracy of Hope. And it was, uh, it was a similar thing, only it was sort of less bands, and we went on the road. So we flew to San Francisco and met up with, you know, all the other bands and the, and the, and the, the show. On like a Friday or something, and then we pull, and then we played at the Cow Palace on Saturday night. And then Sunday, like we all traveled in one. At this point, we traveled in a chartered jet. Oh so wow! There's uh, at that time, you know, like the headliners were uh, Sting and his first solo album, right, '86. So his Dream of the Blue Turtles, his first album was uh, had been out for a year. So it was that band, which for the for all of us band guys, it was insane. We're we're on the flight. With those guys, with U2, with Peter Gabriel and his band, um, um, there's a couple of other bands. Um, I'm, I'm gapping on a couple of things here. And then we would fly to L.A. And then in each city, we did six shows, six cities. And in each city, you know, uh, other some other artists would join. So L.A., um, well, Tom Petty, when they were uh, Bob Dylan's band. And... Um, so those guys played, although I was hosting my family and I really didn't, I saw that and went, oh yeah, cool. I love Tom Petty and then walked away. But knowing what I know now, I'm like, Fuck, I wish I could go back and watch Tom Petty with Stan Lynch and, and the original lineup playing a show, playing a set, you know, uh, you know, um, and, and then a couple of days later, you know, we did, so we did three shows and we're hanging, you know, you go to the hotel lobby like you do in any tour, but. You go over there, and there's Kenny Kirkland, and there's uh, Branford Marsalis, and there's uh, oh, and Omar Hakim, and well, there's Larry Klein, who's uh, the husband of Joni Mitchell, an amazing producer, bass player. All these guys hanging out. Hey, man, we're having breakfast. And so you're hanging with these dudes, the shy Canadians over here, you know, but after a couple of days, you sort of got used to it. these are our people, and we're all hanging out. But this is the thing, too, <laughs> is, is that... I, I've heard stories about Kiss going on tour with Rush, and Rush was in bed by nine thirty. You know, I don't yeah, know yeah. that Canadian I know. thing. <laughs> I know it's pretty good, and they were, you know, of course, in recent years, Neil and Alex have sort of spoken of their, you know, uh, they 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 came across and and did things properly, like there were some real clean cut Canadian boys, and they didn't go out like the Kiss boys and whatever they were doing. After the shows, if they're going to bars or whatever they were doing, those guys apparently were in the hotel. But I think they were like, for whatever reason, they were doing that. And they maybe just liked that. Certainly Neil did. But I think they really like to have scotch and weed as well. Yes. So then I was you know, in my 40s or my 50s going, okay, awesome. They were as real as we always hoped they were. 
Yes. You know, because we were in high school smoking weed listening to Rush. So Yeah. <laughs> they were making Rush and smoking the weed and doing the scotch. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. So much stuff. I, every once in a while, you know, I think it's part of being in your 50s. You're constantly, I think back to some things or this, uh, this era that we're talking about in the mid-80s and I was doing these things. And I, in fact, last night I was just kind of going, okay, I got serious about actually playing drums in – uh, 74 and I was 12 and that was the bad company first album came out and that was so so yeah uh, Can't Get Enough Love was on the radio all the time and a friend of mine his brother had drums and we went up to we would just ride little BMX bikes all the time in Southern, I was living in Southern California at the time and he goes hey check this out this is what you got. This is what you do. I just remember him saying that. He put on the headphones, dropped the needle, ran over to the drums, and started playing Can't Get Enough Your Love. I had done lessons about three years earlier, but I didn't play. I, I would go to my room and just go hard until I had a good sweat. And then I'd go, my mom always had iced tea in the fridge. And I just, I get a good sweat. I'm like, oh, I'm pretty sweaty. I'm going to stop now. I was like, I don't know what I thought I was doing, working out or something. Right. And, you know, uh, our, all we did was ride bikes. And then my brother started playing guitar, and, and then I had the drums. And then, so then my buddy gets off the drum set, and I go, okay, well, I know how to do that. So he drops the needle, and I start playing Can't Get Enough Your Love. And at that moment, that was, okay, I'm now playing drums. It was like, I, I just went, I, I left there, I rode my bike home, and I was stoked going, I need a stereo. I, took, I did the math. I go, I can do what we just did, but I, I can't do it without a stereo because we're putting headphones on and, and playing along, you know? And so then, I mean, it's funny how life is. If you think back to when you're 12, six, you know, that's like what, April or May or something. So uh, by the following September, like six months later, I earned some money that summer and I bought a little stereo. But then I had to wait till December to get headphones. Right. I don't even know how I did it. <laughs> but now December happens and I got headphones. Now I'm winning. Now I got albums to play or I would play to the radio and there was, you know, different songs. Uh, there was, a, I would put on the radio and, and it was uh, KKDJ Los Angeles. And so there was like, um, You're No Good by um, Linda Ronstadt was a huge hit on the radio. And I remember thinking, there's a fill in there. Oh, I know how to do that. And there's and there's a thing they were doing. I mean, I wish I could hear a recording of what I was doing, but I was able to play along to the songs. But Jethro Tull had a big song right then called Bungle in the Jungle. When that song came on, I just put the headphones down. I didn't have a freaking clue. When I, Even now when I listen to it, I go, what is he actually doing? Like, it's pretty progressive, <laughs> but I couldn't play that. So I'd get up and I'd put on, and then, you know, I had the first three Kiss albums, and like, man, when, when, uh, what was it called? Room service? Dress to Kill. Yes. The song was room service. All, all the songs on there were awesome to play. And I, anyway, and, and, and so that's, but then, so that's 1974, 75. Nine years later, like 10 years later, I mean, I guess it takes 10 years. I don't know. I was recording a record with Brian Adams. Like it's, I was just thinking of that last night. I was going, it's interesting what happens. You just sort of play at home and you, and you, my brother and I and another dude, we would jam all the time. And then, then by about grade 10, I, I started taking music and like band and stuff in high school. And then a guy, my teacher taught me to read. So, you know, and even at that time, grade 10, you know, four years later, five years later, I was doing that stuff. And it's just kind of interesting to look back. Whereas nowadays, five years, you know, five years ago, I was, doing the stuff that you're asking me about right now but when you're 15 to 20 the five years that, that that five years that's incredible big big moves you know right and then i think the other thing is too is you know again my friend rick walker says it's like going down a hallway with your music in general learning you get to another door there's a bit of a longer hallway so as you get yeah, older right. it's just the hallways may become shorter. It's just maybe a little technical twist here and there right. or something you've worked on and invented, you know? So I just think it's incredible that, you know, you've had all these experience. I was, 
wanted to bring this up, and this is something that you did with the odds, but when I was in Cancun on vacation, I speak English, Spanish, Starbucks, texting, and love. And at the hotel, right. <laughs> yeah, so if you're ever in trouble in Mexico and need to order a Starbucks, call me. So I'm hanging out at the hotel. I think I was on the ninth floor. I jump on crowded elevator. They're all speaking French. And I go, je m'appelle Francois. And they go, oh, ta -ta. and I said, where's everyone from? They go, we're from Montreal. And I said, that's interesting. Well, where are you from? I said, I'm from where they invented ice hockey, Boston, Massachusetts. Boo, boo. <laughs> I'm glad I made it out alive. But I thought yeah, right. it must have been so much fun as well, you know, and I, you know, in front of 100,000 people or a packed audience, especially with hockey, what was it like, you know, with the Olympics and with the Vancouver Canucks playing with them or for them? Okay. Yeah, I know that was like right now, that was 10 years ago, which is bizarre. Um, <laughs> again, you were 28 again, like myself. We just stay at 28. Yeah. The 27 kids yeah, couldn't was, make it. <laughs> I was at my first round of 28. Um, <laughs> <I know. laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a super cool thing. You know, we kind of just invented it as we went. And then after, a, you know, after we did a, a, a probably a game or something, a couple games, we had the, we had the system dial. We, we knew what we needed to do. We had a friend who's kind of a, he works for an agency in town, but he was also the house DJ there for years. It was like the dream job he wanted among other things and and so he was a guy in there he was one of the first guys to, he's got those samples of david lee roth going woo from <laughs> running with the devil yeah he brought those he brought that into the i don't know if he's the first guy but i never heard it except for him and now i hear it at other hockey games and sporting events you know so uh he was a funny guy and, and just on fire and uh he would he would talk with our guitar player, Craig from the, from the odds band and about what song we should, uh, here's a, what song should we do this week? Right. And everything, cause the, the media department that hired us, like everyone in the building that works for the, for the, the team, they're so superstitious. It's a sports superstition. Oh yeah. Almost like we can't, there was times where it was like, we can't play that song. Cause the last time we played it, the team lost that, 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 uh, that game. And it was a, a crucial game. Mind you, we did win the series or, you know, whatever happened. Right. And we're like, oh, my God, the superstition, you know. So, um, but it, it, the cool thing was everything that really worked was either ACDC or sometimes Zeppelin. Right. We did Panama a few times. Um, you know, things that were, it was either lyrically uh, a metaphor for, you know, you know, we're not going to take it. We did. I don't think we did that one, but that would be it. You know, we're not going to. Hey, San Jose, we're not going to take it. We're not taking your crap. Your ass, you know? Exactly. <laughs> so, um, you know, there had to be a metaphor, and in what, or else, just an exciting riff. You know, I tell you, one of the greatest times that I recall was we, for some reason, we chose. You know, because it's like uh, we'd work up maybe six little thirty-second hits, and then day of, we would decide, okay, we'll do these four. But if, if we're down at the end of the second period or in the second period when we do our show, if we're down, then we'll do this one instead oh, of that cool. one or whatever. And I don't remember why, but we chose Iron Man. Oh, okay. So, and, and here's what's happening. is The technology, it's like a wireless mic, right? we got one in the bass drum, one on the snare, and one on the – I had a cowbell brought that in uh, for some things. But it's, I had just like three wireless mics on me, and then I had a tech that traveled with me. The guitar players were like – across the arena and up a floor with wireless mic on each, like a little wireless DI on each of these little tiny Yamaha amps. And same with the bass player. And he was often, he was standing behind the goalie. And he really? Like, he would stay there for almost, there was, he was there the whole game a bunch of times. He's just standing behind him. And one time we finished our, our hit and I go, I got enough time. I'm going to run down. I got an all access pass and come down behind the goalie and go stand with Doug. And I'm standing back there, and the L.A. Kings were in town, and I'm like, those guys are huge. Like, they're, <laughs> they're like six-foot guys, and they're wearing, you know, four or five inches of, of blade. Oh, yeah. I'm standing back there. Yeah. Amazing, man. It's very exciting. But I'll, I'll tell you, the coolest thing of all of that 
was uh, our strippers union bandmate leader, Rob Baker, is a uh, guitar player from the Tragically Hip, right? Uh, long, he, he's got straight long hair. Yeah. And uh, if anyone sees him, they, they, just, they just know. Now, that band and Canada and hockey, those three things are just, they're in, they're in the fabric. Of, of Canadians, you know. Well, you also even invented. People, even like your friend's parents could be at an event, and a, a hip song would go off, and everyone <laughs> would blow up, and they would. They might not know why, but they're they're into it. You know, it just it just the, the hip. Their songs just cause that. Well, we started doing in the playoff round uh, against San Jose. Was we like we started bringing in? Okay, let's bring in for a night. Uh, a, a name artist. We had Randy Backman. We had Paul Rogers from Bad Company, which was a super wow. Um, um, but but nothing was greater than playing with Rob Baker because first of all, he's our friend, and we had to learn some. We never, I'd never really played any of those songs. Lots of lots of younger musicians coming up in Canada would have in cover bands. They would have played tragically hip songs. So we're like, we're going to play a song called New Orleans is Sinking. Everyone in that place is going to shit their pants when they hear this. You know. Um, there's a song called Little Bones, which even more, it's as, it's as potent to a Canadian at a hockey game as if you hear Highway to Hell or Back in Black or something to anywhere in the world. You know what I mean? Yes. So we're up there and this riff called for Little Bones starts up. I remember sitting there at the kit and it's, it was amazing. It's like we're up you know, like four to two against San Jose or something. It's Friday night. We're going to play four little hits throughout the night of tragically hip songs and like you can't lose like, no like, this is so cool i'm sitting there and i'm looking around at people i got my earbuds in i got a guy talking to me going okay odds on and after this next uh, uh, uh you know dr pepper commercial and then i'll count you guys in from 30 seconds you know and i'm going man these people sitting here 10 feet from me like i would have a drum kit there and you know people would get excited by that we started doing it i was just drums and then we added, and then let's add the band. I mean, we just created this thing. But man, when we, when we we're getting ready to kick into little bone, little bones, and it's it's one of those riffs, and that everyone in the room is going to know it. And and and, I was, and and I'm just looking at the people around me, and the riff starts. Fuck the riff forever. Even when I hear it now, I don't actually know where one is. Is it three, four, bone, da 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 da, one da 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 da, or is it? One and down and one, and one, one and one and like I sort of don't know. And then while rehearsing it, I figured out to go. Okay, as soon as I hear this, which is the second round of him playing that riff, I'll know where one is. And I'm sitting there going, crossing my fingers, going, hope I don't blow this, because there's two, three, boom, it pushes right when it comes in. So the, the anyway that that happened. The greatest Canadian song at at the greatest Canadian game and our team yes. in the playoffs. You know, round seven. And f- in front of a packed house. And or not round seven, sorry. You you take, I mean, you know, as we do here, but it's it's serious. Yeah, <laughs> yeah what, would be the, uh, what would be the equivalent in Boston, man? It would be uh, a certain old school Aerosmith song for sure. Yes. Or, yeah. or even, you know what, too, even at the Patriots games, which I go to, uh, yeah. they kick out with the crazy train, you know, nice. and the Randy yeah. Rhodes, you know, the riff and it's yeah. just, everybody goes nuts. And, yeah, uh, that's one of those songs, right? Yes. It's the riff. riff that gets people going. And that was the fun thing about doing that. It's like, Hey, this is sports. We all love sports and play. And, um, and, and, and we're rock and rollers and we love rock and roll. And, and the majority of people, we live in a, in a, a generation where pop culture since we were 10, you know, it is remember, remember they talked about a thing called pop culture back when you're in like grade school. And, <laughs> yes. You know, now it's just, that is the world. Everyone knows rock and, and, you know, Dr. Martin's used to be worn only by punk rockers. And then, you know, by the time uh, the nineties happened and all those bands in Seattle were sporting that, then, then the rich mums in, in the little suburbs, you know, the Crocs. they're buying Dr. Martin's <laughs> oh, yeah. 14 year old girls and whatever. <laughs> that's just how it goes, you know? No, no, it does. And that's, you know, it's, you know, with that, to be able to experience these things, 
Um, it's just really amazing, you know, the things you've done. And if you would just encapsulate, did you ever play ice hockey, by the way? Well, I, I'm the one guy who never did. It just didn't happen. And when my family moved to America and no one in our family, I just played a bit of basketball and a bit of baseball, but yes, so and I didn't. I've had a few times where we, we do a thing and we'll go play on the ice. No, and I think... At a, lake, at a frozen lake or something, you know? No, for sure. And from my experience, I went to the University of Maine and I worked for the hockey team for a summer. And I never uh-huh. really skated, but I got to, you know, skate with this young kid, Paul Korea from Vancouver, British Columbia. Oh, wow, man. Oh, yeah. I would trip he over the... amazing. Oh, yeah. Uh, one of the best... I would trip over the blue line. We'd play these night skates. Trip over the blue line, shoot him the puck for a goal. It's still an assist. <laughs> I was wow, terrible. That's amazing. So you were, you were in the hockey program there. Yes, I, w- I worked for Coach Walsh. I worked for the athletic department, but I did his summer camp uh, my last okay. year in college. That's amazing. Yeah, it's just well, this is the whole the whole thing. To and this is. And I, I was going to ask you, but this is what I would say to everybody. Try new experiences. Uh, you know, I would play with the baseball team. I would, you know, played basketball and was sufficient. Ice hockey was new to me, but it was fun. And that's why, you know, starting music later in life, um, you know, we just, it's something new and it's something to try and nothing to be ashamed of. It was just yeah. so much fun. When you get around professionals, you get better, always playing with better people. So with that, do, what would you say, A, to your younger self or to young kids starting out with music? Uh, one thing I do say to a lot of younger players, and if they're drummers, is learn, take piano or guitar and learn about the, the theory and the harmony of what's going on and and then you can learn songs and learn the songs i mean i i say that and i still i don't know why it's a mental block i've never really sat down and learned a lot of the songs in the bands that i'm in but when i when i go to do recording sessions and i get somebody hands me a number it's like a nashville number system a chart um i can look at it and i know what's going on and I know what I know what these I know what this means. That means this song's kind of in a minor key, so it's going to be kind of dark, you know. Or it's going to be in a happy key, and it's 120 beats per minute. Oh, this is going to be fun. It's going to be like, uh, you know, whatever. Um, Mellencamp in the 80s. Uh, Ken Aronoff. I, I followed a lot of stuff that he does, and and use it as a template in my mind for maybe how to achieve something, you know. So it just makes you a better uh, drummer to understand, like, hey, get a bit of the dose of the guitar, the bass, Yeah, get, piano. get that going, you know, um, be, I, because I did. And, and, I, and it's helpful. Uh, there's some, a couple of things, and I, I use it every day, you know. And it's just like, it's just, when I hear a song on the radio by, whether I know it or not, I just kind of, where what's going on here? Where is the bass or the guitar? What is the root movement? What's going on here? And I just like knowing that. You know, and when you do know that, you know the music more. You're you know you're more connected to the music. Um, and I, I've had times recently. I did a uh, an ACDC tribute with some guys around here a few years ago, and it was only and they're kind of punkers. The, the one guy he he did a combination. He was Bon and Angus. Oh, nice. And he did a really good <laughs> job. Cool. And, and, and he didn't want to do anything with Brian Johnson. He only wanted to do uh, Bon Scott stuff. And I'm like, that's fine. And it, holy shit, man, fast and furious. And Power Age is like my favorite record those guys did. And um, I mean, that and, and Highway to Hell, Back in Black. There are some really good playing, some really good songs and riffs. But I think my favorite is, is Power Age, you know. But anyway, I got into a situation we were rehearsing and I realized... Okay, what the, it was like one of these things, like I was 17 again, and I didn't know anything about the music. I knew what I, I learned my part. Why, why didn't these guys learn their part? Or why didn't that guy, and this guy's trying to tell them, and I'm listening to what they're playing, and I'm going, that's not even the right part. Right. And I've been listening to the shit out of these songs, because they're great. And so I was sitting there going, okay, i got to figure out how to uh, 
we got to move on from here because this is like uh, it's like I'm back in high school and I'm in my 40s and we're we're bogged down. It's like what that is. I never deal with that because most of all the players I play with are are really good and they can read or or they 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 just work in a different way. These guys are this band was really good when we you know we just hit the odd bump and they just weren't like school sort of guys. They were just went by ear punk rocker guys, right? And and it was cool, but it was this moment where I realized I go. Well, I can't say number system to them because they won't have a fucking clue. I'll right. Have to walk them through. Well, we're playing in G, so the C is the four. You know, G A B C. So there's four, and you know, you, I, uh, between three guys, one guy's just going to stare at you like and ask you to shut up. Uh, and then I can't really use sort of traditional uh, chord speak, and so I just look at. I'm looking at the bass player, and I'm like, okay, what key is this song in, guys? Okay, that's a wrong. That was the wrong question. <laughs> well, I don't know. We're playing on G, and then they look around and they go, "Okay, it's actually in D." Okay, uh, and and all I wanted to say was because if you're going to play those ACDC songs, I don't want to jam them. No, exactly. Them that's the exactly yes. Like I played it, and I want you to be Malcolm Young because it's all about Malcolm Young and Phil Red, the, all that stuff. And so when the guys were just sort of, you could see a guy was jamming his way through it. I'm like, I want no part of that. Wait a minute. Stop. Anyway. So it was kind of funny. I was trying to find a way to communicate how the part went. I could sing it or give me your guitar. I'll play it. You know, anyway. Well, no, the other uh, thing is too, we, so, we, so it helps. I, I guess that's, that's what I would pass on. Uh, your question was like, and to your younger self, I, uh, I don't know, man. Uh, Try to, I, I, I have had times where I'm going, how do you, okay, this is the most amazing thing right now. Take it all in. How do you take it all in? I don't know. How do you take it all in so you remember it? And so that uh, one day or 10 years later, you can, if someone asks you about it, oh, I can recall that. Boom. You know, like the live eight thing, people ask about it. And I go, you know what? It was a rush. Like literally, uh, like it, it blew our minds. And we, uh, I think we um, flew in from somewhere, landed in Philadelphia. We're getting a, a van, and uh, we're coming in uh, the day before the show. And um, we always stayed at the Four Seasons Hotel. We had a deal with them in Canada. Canada, And uh, um, we didn't have cell phones, so you imagine. We pulled over. The tour manager jumps out, runs to a pay phone, puts a quarter in, <laughs> phones the uh, hotel. The Four Seasons, and they go, ah, Mr. Lagden, we're, we've uh, been waiting to hear from you. We've got all your rooms ready as per normal, because we had played there once or twice already. And, and, and he's like, yes, because otherwise the, the show was going to put us, I don't know how we got onto this. I'm onto, uh, oh, how do you remember things? <laughs> uh, the show had put us in some crap motel, Super 8, way nowhere near anywhere. So now we're staying at the best hotel. You know, we go to the lounge that night. Oh, there's Eric Clapton and uh, what's his name, Carlos Rios. And, and there's so many. We didn't even know what we were about to see tomorrow. We just knew there's going to be a lot of bands there, like like any festival, you know. So that. And then the next day we just come in and people go, well, what do you remember? And I don't really remember a ton. I remember, I can't remember getting out of the, the van and grabbing my bag. Yeah, you always have a day bag of clothes or whatever. I don't really remember doing all that. I just remember that we were there and I got, at, got to our trailer. I walked out. I kind of looked around and there was all these names on the trailers. And that one said Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. And this one said that. And then I walked around and there was like a common area. I probably didn't have much time to hang out because when I get talking about it, I go, why didn't I just go hang out in that area and, you know, get a coffee or something and just watch the people? Because I looked over and there was Paul Stanley with <laughs> two sitting with these two ladies and they were definitely sisters and twins kind of in like a bikini or something on a couch in, in the, in the VIP area. And I just went, well, that's not that just take all, you know, it's just like, Oh, uh, here we are. <laughs> and then, and then it was like, Hey, you got to go up and check your drums. Okay. So then you run up and it was this huge round stage right now. Rick Springfield is playing and my drum kit is behind them. So, um, I got to sit at the kit. It's a, it's a, it's a rental, you know, and then we put my symbols up and then we get, get, get it all adjusted. To, okay. It's all adjusted to me now, you know, and now it's like, okay, I got to run back to the trailer. I got to get changed, man. It's hot. 
and then all these things. Oh, we got to do this photo shoot, and blah, blah blah, and then boom, and then we're on. And we did our set, got up, changed, and got on our, and then zoomed out to the airport, and then took a, a little private jet out to, and then we had a show that night. Well, the. <laughs> So how do you, uh, you know, to the younger self, how do you take that in in a way so that you, because you're, have fun with it, experience it, be excited and take it all in. But so, I don't know, you take in and you remember what you can, I guess. No, 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 absolutely. And that's for my trip to the grocery store today. I mean, whatever it may be, it's like, how do you extra do it? Because it's kind of like the meme of, you know, you see the rock star lifestyle and then you see what it really is you running to check the drums you were almost in a super eight now you're at this and that but uh it's kind of like it's it's a wonderful experience and it's you know at the end of the day you know we still have to take the trash out so it's like yeah you know i know that's what i'm saying that's why it's like covid everyone's doing the same ashton kutcher you know, yes. any, you know, or any of those great Hollywood people that we watch or whatever, we're all doing that. We're all doing the same thing. And people are getting more things done right now than they were a year ago. Like, oh, I can do Zoom or I can have meetings with in a place that's safe and have mask or double mask or whatever you do. Or, you know, some people are I think a lot of people down there have had two vaccines now. So that's helpful. Um, uh, you know, it used to be. I used to think um, Christmas, that's the one day, like I remember thinking, you know, like, oh, what's, you know, whoever, what's, what's Eddie Van Halen doing today or Michael Jackson or, 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 you know, any celebrity, what are they doing? They're doing the same thing. They're with their family and they're young or they're, or they're a family person now or or whatever, an adult, you know, with kids and they're, but we're all doing the same thing. So it used to be one day a year. I, I could think of that, but now it's like, you know, everyone's doing the same thing. <laughs> Here we are. And um, I used to have a joke with my uncle and he'd be like, you know, he'd scream at me, you know, take this trash out. And he goes, yeah. this is, this is your Ricky Martin the day before he became famous. Like his uncle was screaming at him, you know, take out the trash. Yeah, it's, right. it's just, yeah, you know, right. it, 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 it's, it's just the human condition. And that's why. You know, you being the self-proclaimed funniest guy in the band, you know, we need humor, you know, to deal with, you know, to A, lift other people's spirits because there is so much hurting. And that's why, you know, I respect so much that you've done that stuff for the food bank as well as, you know, contribute your art and great experiences. What I kind of wanted to close with was with, you know, with the odds Strippers Union, uh, Cobra Ramon, and New Yank Yorkies. Um, what, what's kind of like ahead for all of you with all of this? Will some stuff pick up more than others? Is it kind of a patchwork thing that you'll be going forward with? Is it just all dependent on everybody getting vaccinated and touring? Oh, uh, what, you mean getting for... For me, for us? Yeah, for project. you in general, like, you know, with with all the different projects that you're in. Right. You know, is, you know what's what's next, in other words, for all of them? Yeah, well, as far as that, like playing, live playing, you're saying, right? Yeah, live or cutting some new albums with them or... Yeah, well, there is a new odds record in the pipeline. And, and we just, you know, with management, you know, most recent conversation was let's just watch a little bit here and let's just see what happens. Cause we had some conversations in November with a, a group of guys out of a label in Toronto. And that's exciting to be affiliated with some guys again. Cause we've been, it's been pretty independent the last couple of years. Um, uh, so there's that there's, uh, we're working on, we're, uh, we've got another Cobra single. We just kind of do singles with her. And I mean, everyone does now. So uh, uh, the odds we have made, uh, I think we recorded, I think it's too many songs. Like people don't even barely have attention span for a 10 song record. I, I'm still, I still need to listen to that whole strippers thing and, and a couple other things. And I like, I listen to some of it and I'm like, Oh, cause I don't know. Apparently I'm busy. Like I don't No, I tr- for a lot of people, a life has changed where 
I was, I, I say the classic is when you were 20 or whatever, and you moved into a house with some friends, the first thing you did was you set up your stereo. Yes. And then you put on a record or a CD, whatever you had, right? And then you'd load all your shit in, but you had music going, you know? And nowadays, it's, I, I don't, sadly, I don't have that as part of the thing like I used to. I, I, and I'm like, I'm not sure what happened. You know, we moved from one place. Uh, we, we were living, my wife and I, out uh, sort of in a, over on a, a big island nearby here. We lived there for a while. And I just kept my whole thing going, but it was so busy commuting on flights or ferries that I said, we got to get back to Vancouver. So we came back here about 10 years ago. And I think that was when we moved into an apartment for the first time ever. And apartment is life is weird. I don't, I don't know it. Cause I've always lived in like homes, you know, and I didn't set a stereo up really, or maybe I did. I can't remember, but it's so it's ever since then. So I don't know. I need to get back to that. Well, it, you know, lot, but you know, lots of people. I think I'll, I've had this conversation with a few people, and and and, and the music listening these days, it's probably age related too. But it's just different. In what sense do you think it's age related? Well, somebody picked it out. They said, "Oh, you mean you just do like a you listen to single songs? Like you got a playlist?" And you go, "I do. I have certain playlists. I made a thing on Spotify last year because I had read um, Steve Gorman, the Black Crows drummer." big fan of him big fan of those guys and i read his book and while i was reading i was like oh my god i gotta get back and then so i put the whole playlist together and then um and then and then i i started adding stuff to that and one day i was thinking of a song domino or something by van van morrison i'm like so i'm gonna put that on there and listen to that on my ride to the whatever you know and so although i wasn't really playing much music which is a, an outlet a soulful outlet you know not getting enough of that and I'm getting to record a couple of couple of days a week. I'll go to a studio and, and work on some songs with somebody. So that's good. Um, I'm in my little drum world right now. And after we speak, I'm going to play a bit. But, um, um, okay, edit, because I just forgot where the hell I was. <laughs> no, but listen, <laughs> no, this is my my experience recently, is that you, I got a record. <laughs> yes, I got a record player, and I haven't played vinyl in decades. And what yeah. was funny to me was I played the Moody Blues, a couple of their albums, stuff I've never heard before. Uh -huh. And I was like, wow, this is interesting, and the concepts and, you know, what influenced them. And then I play, you know, a musical, and a lot of this stuff, you go to a record store, I've been to two of them in a month to pick out different records, to see Earth, Wind, and Fire. You see, uh, you know, the different genres. But playing a record, after 15 minutes, you have to get up and turn it over. I was like, wow, I forgot about that. Right. And then I'm going to send this to you. Uh, I found this record out of the trash. And this is what's important. And... Being stuck at home, I haven't seen these movies in a long time, which is old school wedding crasher, where it was that free lifestyle where I used to just go to clubs and chat it up with the gals and have some fun and go out with my buddies. Yeah. And that yeah. brought it all back and also a tear to my eye because I haven't done it in a year. But right. I saw the movie Gladiator and the speech that he gives to his troops before they go fight is these two things. He said, you guys are Elysians. You are dead already. So live your life. And it was like, wow, this is what I need to do anyways. You know, I'm still living in the midst of these things that aren't happening. So out of the trash, I saw this album, which you can't find on YouTube or anything. His name is George Cromartie, and he's cut, and, and this is from 1973, and it's uh -huh. the only one, it's the only one music for people who are still growing. And I'm going to send you that link on YouTube because okay. also what the guy in Gladiators, it, Gladiator said, what we do now echoes into eternity. So the stuff that you were doing on Reckless and the Live Aid 
was being talked about in a class. So with what you're doing now, you know, you're still contributing. So it's just really refreshing to see a musician with several, several different groups, you know, and still creating. So, you know, I, I, I really appreciate it, Pat, what you're doing. And, um, that's awesome, Frankie. Thank yeah, you so much, no, absolutely. It's good. It's good. You know what? You, you get, we can get our inspiration from wherever, right? Isn't that great about that gladiator speech? It could be a, a passage in a book you're reading and you know, it, it could, wherever, if it inspires you good, that's all that matters. Did you like it? You know, not, not everyone's going to like it. That, that doesn't matter. What matters is it inspired you, you know? And, so. and, and for sure, when you, you know, you know, reach back uh, to Bill Ward's thing coming, you know, decades later and using kind of a twisty turny in a song. I had my uncles, I was with them the other day and my beautiful mother, she sent me a book, Mm -hmm. Jesus Calling. And so there's a couple books and my uncles were like, read us a passage. So I read a passage, which was. Are these like her brothers? Yes. Yes. Okay. And so the passage ended up being, um, you know, the person died, and the fool walked by and said, just leave the body alone. A wise man walked by and said, I'm going to bury myself with this person. And then the moon laughed and cried. And my uncles were like, read that again? And I did. Oh, so like, we probably really need to just stay in the moment. Uh, that's really interesting that Jesus calling had that. And I said, no, this is actually an essay of a hundred people. It's called the book of the hanged. And it was words that people said before they were hung in Italy in the 1500s. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So, heavy, yeah. So again, there's a lot of different stuff out there. And, uh, it was fun to pull a pa- pull, try to pull a fast one on those two. They're pretty quick. So we had a good laugh over it. But I think, yeah. again, you, you know, talking about, hey, you know, I call it the bacon grease of life. Because bacon grease to me, you throw it on uh, cauliflower and it t- makes it taste good. You know, set up that record player and, you know, have a blast. Yeah, man. I know I keep getting vinyl from people. Uh, uh, we'll work on a record, and then they'll, they'll they'll give me the vinyl. So I got a few things, but um, I got um, uh, I got to get another turntable. You know what I really want to get is you know remember the old console unit? And, and it, did that have the eight track as well? It, yeah, sure, I don't care if it said Gerard or BSR turntable, you know, whatever. There was a, a few years ago, I was like really hot on it. And I, you know, would be on the road and we'd stop in a little thrift shop and go, Oh my God, there's a good one. But I'm like, how am I getting that home from here though? <laughs> Shit. Okay. Well, well, my buddy just but, came uh, back from Arizona. It's kind of fun super warm, you know? No, no, for sure. For sure. I was, Your buddy what? my buddy uh, just came back from Arizona and uh, uh-huh. he actually bought an extra piece of luggage because his brother has all these grapefruits. And he just packed it with grapefruits from, from the trees. And he gave me two oh, yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> he gave me two yesterday. Honest. It's been a pleasure to share your life and experience in music. And I really appreciate the quote that would inspire anybody. It's been a, ro- a long road to this point. But in a lot of ways, we're just getting warmed up. So I can't wait to see what you're doing in the future. Awesome, buddy. I appreciate it. Well, yeah. though, you, I'll be released. There's going to be some things coming out here in a little while. You know, we're just mixing a couple things here and there. And so I'm excited about that. That stuff's coming out. This is before I was in the band. And them and and uh, also the band called the Gin Blossoms. You remember those guys? Oh, of course. And they're, they were pal- in the early days. The, uh, the odds guys before I was in, they, it's, it's like 88, 89, around then they started going, someone recommended them. And so then they, boom, they would go to, they would go down to LA about every couple of months and get, uh, we, we made friends with a guy at ASCAP and who introduced us to the other guy. And this Chris Blake was our manager. And uh, so he was organizing these things to come down and do these, you know, uh, best unkept secrets, uh, these secret shows that, you know, and it would feature Matthew Sweet, 
was one of the guys, the, the Gin Blossoms, the Odds, there was a few other acts. But those guys were all there for it, which is a great story of the 90s, early 90s, and that kind of pop, you know. And then the Gin Blossoms, you know, they got signed, and they, those guys blew up. And they've always been pals, and we've done, we've toured with them a, a few different times. And um, Craig and the gentleman's name is Jesse Valenzuela. He's a guitar player, singer, second singer in, in, in the Gin Blossoms. And they started, like, they did a record together. So before, you know, like, like the Strippers Union thing, that happened because we had a little side project, which was inspired by Booker T and the MGs. So odds were touring and it was like 97, 98. We put this little side project together because we wanted to play at the hockey games, but we played at the basketball games when Vancouver had the, the, uh, the giants, when we had that team. So we played at some games, but anyway, Rob Baker, a few years later goes, well, my favorite band is shark skin is what we were called. So I want them to be the band on my album, but Craig is my favorite lyricist. So those guys were already pals. And so that's how, Strippers Union happened was that Craig and Rob wrote and then the band that we had with Craig recorded the track. So the first Strippers Union album, if you haven't heard any of it, like this, this is the third one that's out now. So that's that. A similar thing that happened a few years before that was with Jesse Valenzuela from uh, the Gin Blossoms. And he and Craig wrote a bunch of songs. So we did a record and one of the songs in there is a theme song from a show called Corner Gas. Corner Gas is massive in Canada, and it's now an animated version, but it's also all over the world. It's one of those shows. And uh, so if you were to speak with either of those two dudes, there's lots of great stories. Well, and, and, and Jesse's got all his great Gin Blossom stories. So, And then maybe what I'll do is I'll just uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll copy it. I'll send it to Craig because he's a real good guy at rounding people up, and I'll tell him what. Uh, I'll tell them a bit about what you and I did, and you know maybe they want to do some more too. No, that because uh, it's great what you're doing, and it's it's kind of a whole mix. Uh, you have all kinds of stuff in there. Like first I saw Rudy, and then I saw Marco, and I thought, oh, is it because it's always this sort of kind of I'm using the quote fingers metal or rock sort of things. But I think I, I looked through your page, and it's all kinds of stuff. There's sports and stuff too, right? No, absolutely, and that's you know you know with that other thing. Um, we we have another podcast called Secondhand Therapy, and uh, it's oh. just to brighten people's, you know, day up. And we like to joke with our guests, like whether they're psychologists or uh, yeah. Tom Brady Sr. was on that. And uh, it's just to brighten people's days up. But we would also say, look, we really can't afford health insurance, so we're getting free therapy from you once a week. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, man, you know what? Something happened. Fuck, and now I've forgotten what it is. I better start a little page on my phone with, like, things that are funny. <laughs> yes. Uh, I know what it was. My friend, this other drummer friend, sent me something the other day, and he's, like, doing – I said, hey, man, how's uh, – you know, we, we talk about drums or our pets, and he's building a home. And I'm like, how's the home? How's the new place going? He, oh, yeah, it's coming along, blah, blah, blah. And a little while later, he just made a little video and sent it. And he's trying to be that total um, – tradesman blue collar guy right and in the middle of it and he's trying to he, he knows what he's going to say it's coming up and he just loses it and he's just cracking up and there's nothing i love more than that i love when a great comedian when you watch outtakes of like will ferrell or people like that oh and they're God. losing their shit and they can't keep it together to do the skit and so it just takes over and over and over you know and in the case of will ferrell it'll be like from some movie i forget what it was because there's a guy that i've seen on snl a lot a, or uh, a black comedian, yeah, uh, or the landlord, which he uh, Will Ferrell did because he's one of my favorites. Pro the landlord, and the landlord was like a four year old girl screaming at him for the rent. And there's a lot yeah, yeah, yeah. of crazy fun outtakes. That, right? Yeah, so any of these things that make us laugh, you know, I think are really good because sometimes I'll get a laugh and it's so it comes from your gut. And if you're getting some tears as well, yes, it's just the best. I mean, we really need that, you know that and, and playing rocking out but yeah you know well the tour continues and i like to joke um you know and i will always tell people my band opens for yours and i told that to michael sterto and he said no frankie we call it co-head not co-headlining now it doesn't matter who starts first so i was like thank you for, <laughs> <laughs> for 
corrected you on it. Yeah, and it's kind of like, uh, you know, the ego thing. But um, you are a real blessing. Uh, keep up the great work. I look forward to, um, okay, you know, once this other stuff comes out, we can we can do another round and talk about it. Yeah, for sure. And if I think I'll think of some stuff, and I'll um, we'll we'll try to hook you up with some more people to talk to. No, I would love that, brother. And uh, keep up the great work, and we'll talk soon. And you have fun, uh, you know, smashing the drums today. Thanks, man. Uh, you know, you gotta uh, maybe this should, should be my ending card. Is uh, I've forgotten the guy's name, the bass player in Spinal Tap. Yes, his line is the best ever. It's like have a good time. All the time. <laughs> and if if you can, turn it up to 11. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> All right, good sign-off. Yeah. Have okay, a, we'll talk to you again, man. You got it, Pat. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Fun. Bye. And that was Pat Stewart. Uh, what a wonderful conversation to learn about his life and time on the drums, all the great new projects that he's involved in, all the, you know, great stories that he has and sort of the advice uh, and being able to play at hockey games as well as Live Aid. And we need to update his Wikipedia page. Uh, It goes up to 2013, and he's done so much since then. Um, The collaborations that he's had with uh, The Odds Now, Strippers Union, Cobra Ramon, New Yank Yorkies, and I do love his quote. It's been a long road to this point, but in a lot of ways, we're just getting warmed up, and he is, and I'm excited to hear uh, what they're coming out with next, and uh, we're just going to keep rocking out and counting our blessings, and that's been another great episode of Melted with Pat Stewart, and we're just going to keep rocking out and loving life and it's not my fault if you're not having a good time have a great time we'll talk to you soon sponsored by carlino guitars we love you and have a great day this podcast was produced in collaboration with the boston free radio podcast network part of bostonfreeradio.com and Somerville Media Center, Somerville's longest-running public access media center that enables a vibrant and diverse community to express its creativity, explain its ideas, share its cultures, and foster the individual right to freedom of speech. Learn more about Somerville Media Center at somervillemedia.org or check out some of the other amazing Boston Free Radio podcasts and radio shows at bostonfreeradio.com. Thanks for listening.